Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Strava Spot Structural Virtual Workshop. Um, my name is Basil Tickoff. I am um, one of the three lead PIs for this. Doug Walker and Julie Newman are the other two, and you can see their pictures there. Um, there's a whole bunch of people helping out with this effort. Um, so, um, Noah, <laughs> Noah Phillips, you can see uh, Nick Roberts, Randy Williams, Alex Lusk. You'll hear from them all during the week. Um, Basically this, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction to know what Strabo is, um, why we started it, what all is involved in doing that. Um, I'll stop after about 10 minutes, um, just see if anybody's got any big questions and we'll go on from there. So this is the team that um, works um, to develop the, the Strabo Spot on sort of a, a weekly basis. Um, although we have four other people who are joining us who have been kind of instrumental in different parts of this. Each one of these folks will um, present a, um, a part of this workshop um, in, different, in different ways. And so you'll, you'll get to hear from them and their contributions. And uh, Rick is, not the, is the one who's least involved with Strabo Spot per se, but he, his um, work and his digital tools are being integrated into Strabo Spot use. And we'll demonstrate that as well. Okay, so Again, we appreciate your participation in this. Uh, somebody noted, we have somebody from every continent, um, except Antarctica, uh, even Zealandia. You want to count that new continent is existing as well. Um, we are part of, we were funded by the National Science Foundation in a series of different grants that were um, given to us, um, and then several of them more recently by the EarthCube program, which we are part of. EarthCube is a bigger effort that's trying to integrate the digital sciences across, the di digital infrastructure across the geosciences. All right, so what are the logistics for our meeting um, for the next, for this next upcoming week? We're gonna use the same Zoom link for all sessions. So if you got on today, you can get on anytime. We're gonna ask you to mute except for the break where you can um, go ahead and Unmute if you have specific questions. Uh, we will have people, however, using the chat window. So we would suggest if you have questions during these presentations, put them in the chat window. Somebody is on that all the time and we'll be able to immediately answer um, anything you have. Um, for If you have questions not during this um, immediate session, we have a Google Doc, which I'll talk about in a second. The agenda is in the PDF, so you know what we have um, going on and sort of the overall flow of it. And then the workshop is really covering the basics, but to get the full ex uh, experience out of Strabo Spot and see its full capabilities, you'll need to explore a little bit on your own. We are going to go sufficiently quickly that you're not going to be able to keep up on your um, laptop or device or if you're using the online version. But um, you, can, you can at least be sort of looking around for that if, if you're the kind of person who likes to do that, if you're the kind of person who just wants to listen and chat. So basically, whatever works. We are going to have a video recording of all of these so that you can always go back and look at them. So that might be the better way to do it, but do whatever works for you. All right, we will have question time at um, several times. If you see those these the, the time or the question mark, you know that that's what's coming up next. Um, but again, you can ask a question in chat anytime. Okay, so this effort, a Strabo Spot, started with the structural geology community. So we're sort of on um, our home ground here, giving it to other structural geologists. We're gonna talk about a couple different things. So just uh, moving forward, it's uh, Strabo Spot's a field app or the Strabo Spot app, which is the one that works on your phone or on an iPad or an an Android. You can be using that or, um, and Doug's going to demonstrate that. Alternatively, StravoSpot also runs on your desktop and you can just do StravoSpot.org and get in that way. The advantage of the app, of course, is that you can take it to the field and then um, get your data down and then it will immediately upload to the data management system. So that's why we work so hard on the app because then it's a straight upload. The reason to use Travel Spot, well, there's a lots of reasons. Um, one is it satisfies the digital requirements for um, NSF grants and structural geology, but also because you start to share data, we can start to do much more interesting science. 
starting from our position in structural geology, I just wanted to quickly say that we have involved a whole bunch of communities in this. So sedimentology has just had their launch. They had a, a, a workshop very much like this one. In fact, we've swiped a lot of their organization because I, we thought they did it so well. For sedimentology, they had we had to develop something, a new thing called a strat mode where you can make a stratigraphic section and save that in Strava Spot. You'll get a demonstration of that. Um, we have also involved igneous and metamorphic um, petrologists. We, they developed vocabulary with new tabs and new tools. You'll see some of that from Alan Glasner tomorrow. We are actively working with the European EPO, so sort of going international for both experimental deformation and with microstructures. So um, again, developing new vocabulary, new standards. So there's going to be this seamless interaction between all sort of the field-based um, traditional geological sciences and then down to microstructures, and in addition to this experimental work. So there's a lot of nice communities involved. OK, so the goal of this workshop is to basically get um, you, as part of the community, involved in using Strabo Spot, so it's sort of a low, um, so it's a lower effort for you to say, oh yeah, I can do this because you'll have had practice doing this. Um, so we're gonna introduce you to the app and the vocabulary. We'll show you how to collect the field data, just like you would do in a notebook, but you'll see there's a huge number of advantages. There's some disadvantages. It's hard to see sometimes in direct sunlight, which is why you can, we have this umbrella picture, but um, basically you can generally uh, work around it, and the technology is going to take care of itself, we're pretty sure. What's nice is that you can link maps, photos, and more. You can put in your own base maps. You can make interpretations. You can then look at your own data, but you can also um, store your own data, query other people's data. Uh, we're going to show you some applications of teaching and research, and, um, and also sort of what's going on with the other communities. So, what you should anticipate from this is it's a very powerful data structure. Um, it will allow you to do things in the future you can't do now, um, such as putting drone images very quickly to use. Um, it does require some time and practice. Um, and the, re the recordings of these, plus the recordings of all the sedimentology um, workshop from two weeks ago and a metamorphic petrology one which is two weeks in the future will all be at your disposal and you can you're welcome to look at them and at any pace you want we are looking forward to your feedbacks um, and we'll develop a fax uh, frequently answered questions sheet from this workshop if uh, that turns out to be useful so a couple tips there's a lot of vocabulary and it takes just some exploration to do um, we think that the, the having the vocabulary all in one place will help the students learn a lot about um, geoscience and how ge geologic field practice works just from doing that. Mistakes do happen, so just keep trying. Don't worry about it. Sometimes the app will freeze up. If that happens, just start it over again. Um, and to avoid any loss of data, go ahead and uh, back up your data regularly. So, so all those things will help. Okay, so. The official times for this workshop are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On, but on Tuesday and Thursday at the exact same time, there's going to be um, bonus sessions, which is if you really want to know about importing different kinds of maps as ma base maps, that's what Tuesday is all about. And basically how you can fly your drone around and immediately put that in as a base map to work on. That is stuff that's coming up on Tuesday. On Thursday, we're going to talk about some of the resources that we developed for teaching with Strabo as classes may or may not go online for fall semester. What the sedimentologists did that worked extremely well is they had a Google Doc. Um, and we'll put that Google Doc, actually if Alex or somebody could do that, that'd be great in the chat window, so that you can um, ask questions anytime. We'll just Put your name, put your email, what your question is, and we will be answering those multiple times a day, and we will answer, we will send the answer directly to your email as well. So you'll get the answer relatively quickly. So that's uh, sort of the help desk. I also wanted to say that just so you have some idea of, we're going to use some of these words sort of inadvertently, so I might as well tell you what they mean. Strabo Spot is just the first version we had of this, which is all pull-down menus. 
Strabo Spot 2 is something we're developing actively for structural geology right now, um, which will be a much more streamlined approach. Strabo Tools is the first set of tools that are available because once you share data, then you can also share resources like tools. And Alan Glasner has done a very nice job with the first iteration of that. And you'll see that. Strabo Micro is just the, really it's for any micrograph. It's we're using it first for microstructure because we always do the structural geology version first, but it'll also get used for petrology. Um, and we'll work with the petrologist on doing that. And then Strabo Search, there's a search engine that allows you to look up data. So, um, and we'll also explicitly talk about that and show you how to do that. Okay, so in this week, today, um, I'm doing the background. Alex will do a field notebook. Um, Ren, actually I'll talk about the vocabulary. Um, and Doug's gonna do an intro to field mapping. On Wednesday, you get more of the Strabo utilities. You get to see what the Strabo search looks like. You get to see what Strabo said looks like. Joe will take you through probably one of the more detailed examples of a Strabo spot data set. Alan will show you Strabo tools. And then Noah or Julie or um, Jason, who is the lead programmer on Strabo Micro, will show you, give you a demonstration of what's, what that looks like at present. Friday will be other um, first of all, everybody has the opportunity to give an example. And we're going to ask you to provide an example from your existing work and upload it as a public project. And then you can basically make it a private project if you want to later, because you can always sequester the data. But then we want several people to go through, we will go through several people's examples and just show everybody what people were able to do within this one week. Um, and it's pretty impressive what you can do within one week um, if you get motivated to do it. Rick is going to show us how um, StarbuzzSpot interacts with his programs. Doug's going to talk a little bit about data management, and then Nick Roberts will give you a um, steps ahead of demonstration for Strabo 2. And then, again, Tuesday and Thursday are just those two different bonus sessions. I should also say that those bonus sessions are also more – They'll, they'll be smaller groups and you can just ask very specific questions like how exactly do I do this? So um, those are for those times as well. All right, that's what I have. The first thing I want to talk about with Strabo Spot is basically how the data is organized. Um, and I did, when we organized Strabo Spot in the first place, and this came out of a, we've had a lot of, of workshops with different people, and it actually came out of the first user workshop of how to organize it. There are two big concepts here, spots and tags. And all of this is how spots and tags interacts with the digital, um, basically that the Strabo Spot system is designed around these two concepts. And in particular, we utilize something called a graph database, which I assume Doug will talk about more um, and, and why that works so well. But I'll, I'll just basically give you a quick overview here. So when you're out in the field, it's gonna look something like this. You're gonna have a, the app will look like this. There'll be points, which are the inverted teardrops, lines, which are those segments. If you hold down the lines, you can draw squiggly lines instead of straight line segments, um, and polygons. So you can basically make points, lines, or polygons, and any of those is a spot. So, you, so the question is like, what is a spot? So let's go, go past that. Well, what we, what we realized in the first time when we were first developing this is that we needed a data system for structural geologists that was really kind of different from anything anybody else had put together. And the reason is some of our data is highly personalized. We use different kinds of notes. Um, it's often descriptive, it's often graphical, it's multi-dimensional and particularly multi-scale. The people go from thin sections to outcrops to landscapes to maps. And also sometimes highly interpretive, which is sometimes it's pretty straightforward and other times you really kind of have to have the interpretation to understand what's going on. And so we designed the system to handle this kind of data. So a spot, the reason it's called Strabo Spot is it's based around this spot concept. And a spot is just a single measurement or an aggregation of individual measurements that characterize a geologic feature at a particular spatial scale. And they allow you to interpret a concept. 
So what's shown on the tablet is Nick's Roberts Field area in Australia. And what you can say is any section there, this is a, this whole thing is, can be considered a spot or an area of interest. Any individual point, you can say, oh yes, that, this spot is where I took my strike and dip. Then I have an area of interest, which is just this hand sample, which is below GPS resolution. And then I made a thin section of that. But all of those spatial scales matter to us. And so what we came up with is a system where the spots are spatially hierarchical, which is to say, if you have a thin section and you have a small, a single mineral grain, it knows it belongs to this overall thin section. That thin section knows it belongs to a sample. That sample knows it belongs to sort of a fold train. That fold train knows it belongs to a map. That map knows where it is in space. So you spots are inherently spatially um, hierarchical. And they're, they're basically microbream spots. They're basically, if you, you basically put a spot on an area and said, what's the chemical composition? You can't say what it is within that area, but you can say this area has this chemical composition. And that was sort of the analogy we were using to start with. Spots can be grouped or something we call nest, nested. And so a nest is just a spatial group of spots. So you can look at any individual point. You can basically say, the yellow spots are associated with a fault. The blue spots are not associated with a fault. And you can group them in that way. And you can do it that for any structure you want. All right, another completely different way of organizing your data is to do it logically. And this is the personalization aspect and that's called tags. So a tag is just like a sticky note that you put on something and it can be your own thing or it can be an interpretive thing or a more observational thing. For instance, if you have this nice isoclinal fold, you can go around, you can have several spots that are around the limb of the fold, and you can say uh, they are all part of that same layer. That layer is a kind of tag because that it's, it provides information about it. Or you can say it's all, and you can say, these two, the black strikes and dips, are also part of the same fold, but they're not part of the same layer. So they would all have fold one as a tag, but um, only the red ones would be also have a tag of layer one in addition to the tag of fold one. It's very powerful to allow you to group data however you want. All right, so this is the same now, sort of more diagrammatically. The reason it works so well is so what's shown on the right where my cursor is is the overall structure of of this fold which is fold one connects to different layers or connects to an axis but this is exactly how a graph database which is on the left hand side works graph databases work because you have nodes that node contains information um, but nodes are connected by edges and those edges also contain information. So that's why the graph database works so well for how we wanted to organize this data system. I should say that this is all um, accessible in this article that uh, Doug is the first author on um, for Travel Spot that shows a lot of these different examples. So you can sort of read about the background of the spots and tags in that way. Um, once you have the common format, you can use common tools. I'm actually not going to talk about this um, now because I'm run over on time. Um, but just to say that, that there are reasons to want to use um, tags and spots in, in useful ways because then you can start to use other tools for those spots and tags. All right. Okay, so what I want to do in the next 20 minutes or so is just give a broad overview on getting started in Strabo Spot. So this is an opportunity for everyone here to follow along. And uh, now would be a good time to fire up your tablets or log on to this uh, Strabo website. This uh, background photo here is just an image of the Glencool thrust in Northwest Scotland. Okay. So specifically what I want to focus on is kind of using Strabo Spot as a digital field notebook replacement. And we're going to walk through a little demo here 
uh, looking at the baseline fault in southern Nevada. So our goal is to have Strabo spot function as a field notebook. And uh, to do this, we need to be able to manage maps. We need to be able to establish stations. And then in each station, we want to do things like add descriptions, add photos, or add structural data. And what we're going to do in the Strabo spot app is create a project. And then within that project, create data sets. And each data set, we're going to add spots, which we can then add structural data, photos. Um, and I'm going to go over a little bit on working with photos as image base maps, which is a really uh, strong um, part of Strabo Spot. And then finally, I'll finish up with showing how we can uh, use some drone, drone imagery as a base map and use that to uh, edit spot locations. So this live demonstration I'm going to show is going to be based on the web app, but you can feel free to follow along on your iOS version. There are a couple differences between the iOS version and the web app. So if you uh, get lost or if you'd rather follow along on a uh, app specific or iOS specific video, you can follow this link um, to YouTube. Or again, just um, it'll be, it's posted up now so you can check it out whenever. I'll leave this up um, just for another couple seconds so people can uh, go to this link if they want to. All right, the main differences between the desktop and iPad views are in this, the location of kind of your main uh, project menu or main menu. So this is an example of um, on the left here, the Strabo web, where over the top um, banner, we have a menu for spots, attributes, maps, project, so on and so forth. This is a little bit different on the iPad version, which is on the right, where because of limited screen real estate, we hide the um, overall uh, project menu and you can access it by clicking on this three bar icon in the upper left hand corner. And once you click on that, it'll bring up this menu where we see spots, attributes, maps, projects, etc. So if you ever get lost in the app, uh, you can always hit the back arrow in the upper left until you see the three bar button and click that to be back at your main menu. So quickly, um, if you're on an iPad, go ahead and get that started up and I'll briefly go through how to set up a project so then we can uh, start at the same point when I switch to the web app version. So once you're logged in to Strabo Spot on your iPad or tablet, you wanna click on the three bar menu in the upper left hand corner and go to Manage Project. And once you're at Manage Project, you can click the three dot menu in the upper right hand corner and select Create a New Project. And here you'll wanna input a project name and any sort of additional information or metadata that you wanna to add to that project. And then press Save. And at this point, um, you can hold on for a second and that's where we're gonna add new data sets. And you can start following along um, on the web app version. So I'm going to switch over here. Yeah. All right, can everybody see now my desktop? Yes, we can see your desktop. Great. So here's uh, the Strabo website. If you just go to strabospot.org. And to start off, uh, click on the account tab and log in and you'll log in here with your login credentials. And I wanna mention um, all of this is also on various YouTube videos on our YouTube channel. So if you get lost or if I'm going too fast, uh, you can always return to existing videos or check out the video um, that's gonna be posted this uh, later after this session. So after you log in um, to access the web app, click account again and go to my data. And here 
now is a list of your projects. So I already created a project here for today's workshop, which is called Strabo Structure 2020. And now we're essentially at the same point um, with the, almost the same point as with the iPad. If you want to create a project, just click the red plus sign um, next to my projects, and you'll go through the same thing that we did on the iPad. And to enter the app, then click view, edit, add data. This will um, pop up with the actual web app. So I'm going to switch to just sharing this. So this is what the main uh, Strabo interface looks like. Our uh, main toolbar is up at the top banner here. And we have our current project, uh, Strabo Structure 2020. What we want to do is we want to uh, add a data set. Each project will come with a default data set, which we can toggle on. But we want to add an additional data set. And we're going to uh, name this baseline fault. Click Save. And on the left here, we want to now toggle on the baseline fault. If you have multiple data sets active within the same project, then you have the option to choose which data set new spots and new data are added to. So at the lower um, right hand corner here, we're currently adding new data to our default data set, but we want to switch over to our baseline fault data set. So in the next couple uh, minutes here, what we're going to go over is uh, two different ways to create spots, how to add orientations, how to add uh, photos, and then use those photos as image base maps, and then finally, how to manage your maps and uh, edit spot locations. So the first way to add a spot is through the main map. And to access the main map, you're going to click on the maps and click main map. And this will bring up uh, the main Strabo map. So a little overview here. We have on the left hand side um, tools to zoom in and out. Basil already mentioned our different types of spots that we can add, a point spot, a line spot, a polygon spot, or we can uh, also edit spots. And then here's our layers panel where we can turn on or off different layers, spots, data sets, and choose which base map we want to use. In the upper uh, right hand corner, we have the ability to uh, access additional tools, toggle on and off point symbology, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then also, if you click the uh, crosshairs here, it will center the map over your current location. If you're on a mobile device, you'll also have a little green dot or red dot. If you have a green dot, it means that you're currently located. So for this example, we're going to zoom in to uh, Southern Nevada. You find Las Vegas. And from Las Vegas, we'll go northeast to uh, Valley of Fire State Park. Once you're about here, let's go ahead and switch from the topo base map to a satellite image base map. You do that by clicking the layers and checking map box satellite. At this point, you can actually already see the trace of the baseline fault right here. I'm going to zoom in a little further and let the satellite imagery load. Uh, the baseline fault is a normal fault that's uh, dipping moderately to the west and you can really easily pick out the trace um, from the juxtaposition of red sandstones in the foot wall with uh, white sandstones in the hanging wall. So let's continue to zoom in. And for this uh, presentation, let's pretend that we uh, drive in along this dirt road, park our field vehicles, and uh, hike up along this four-wheel drive track until we get to uh, outcrop 
um, of the actual baseline fault. So once we're there, we want to add a spot. And we're gonna add a point spot by clicking on the point spot and then clicking again where we want to add this spot. And it's going to pull up uh, the main spot menu. So on top here, you see different toolbars and there are uh, only a two toolbars now, but we're gonna look at how to add more. We have a spot name and the spot name defaults to a unique identifier, which is listed in the bottom under other, along with uh, metadata of uh, timing. You can set the spot to your current location by clicking this button, or if you have a more accurate GPS unit that you wanna use, you can also uh, manually edit latitude and longitude um, here. You can add additional metadata, including uh, the radius of the spot or the area over which this spot covers. And you can add tags, which Basil mentioned. Uh, we're not gonna go into detail on tags, but we'll talk about those uh, later on in the workshop. And then finally, um, you can add notes as well. So we're gonna add a note that this is exposure of the baseline fault. And we're gonna change the spot name to baseline fault one. So at this point, you'll see that this icon came up where it says unsaved changes. We click on that, it's going to save our changes. And if we go back to the main map by clicking on this map icon, we can see that we now have uh, our spot. So let's add an orientation to this spot. You can pull back, um, pull up the spot menu again by clicking this arrow. And what we want to do is we want to add an orientation. So let's uh, click more to bring up options for our basic spot page control. And this is where a lot of customization comes in depending on what your workflow is. For this project, uh, we want to add orientations. We want to add images and samples. And there are uh, many other options here that you can explore on your own time. And there's also options for uh, sedimentology. And lastly, you can add a, a prefix to your spot, your default spot. So it comes up um, with a, a default prefix if you're do, adding a lot of spots to a single project. You can save changes and go back again. And now we're in our spot menu again, but we have uh, more options for adding data. But here we wanna add an orientation. And we're gonna say that we uh, can see, the, see and measure the main fault plane. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click add a plane and this pops up. We have the options here to um, add measurements either by strike and dip or dip and dip direction. And we know that the strike here is 155 using the right hand rule. And the dip, it's dipping uh, 59, about 59 degrees. If you're on a tablet, this icon in the upper right hand corner, the compass, uses the accelerometer in your tablet device to uh, automatically measure the orientation for you. So that's an option. Uh, you can add the quality of the planar measurement. In this case, uh, it's excellent. And then also add what kind of feature you're actually measuring, which obviously for us is a fault. In the upper left-hand corner, we'll click Save. And now under Orientations, we can see that we added a uh, planar feature, fault. And we could always click this uh, blue plus sign to add an associated linear feature. So let's go back to the main map. And you can see that we now have our spot and it has um, an orientation added to it. If we don't wanna see that orientation, we can click the three dot menu in the upper right hand corner and click toggle point symbology to turn that orientation on and off. All right, great. So that's one way to add a spot. And now we're going to go over uh, a second way to add a spot. 
So in the upper left-hand corner, you can click on the spots uh, menu, and this will bring up a list of all of the spots that you have for this project. You can see currently we only have one spot, BF1, that has an associated orientation. Let's go ahead and add a new spot. And this pulls up a similar menu with our spot name as our um, defaults to our unique identifier. We're going to name this one BF2. And because we didn't create this spot through the map, the spot location actually doesn't have, or the spot doesn't have a location yet. So we can either set it to our location or um, we can set it from the map. So I'm going to click set from map. And let's say that we walked from spot BF1 north along the trace of the fault, and we're somewhere in here, right around here. So I'm going to, again, take the spot point, click it, and then click approximately where my spot is. I can add additional uh, metadata here and add notes also exposure of the baseline fault. And we also um, observe some slicken lines here on the fault surface. We're going to save changes. And now we want to add a uh, slicken line orientation. So again, we're going to click orientations. In this case, we're adding a linear feature. So we select add a line, and you can either add it as a trend and plunge or as a rake associated with a planar measurement. Our trend here is 259, and we're plunging about 55 degrees. Again, it's an excellent measurement, and we can choose that we're measuring uh, slick in lines. If you're on the app, you again have the option to use the built-in accelerometer to do this measurement for you. In the upper left-hand corner, let's click Save. And we now have a linear measurement with, uh, that we can add an associated planar feature to if we wanted to. OK, let's return to the spot. And what we want to do now is we want to collect a, a sample at this station. Before collecting the sample, we're going to take uh, a photograph. And on that photograph, we can mark exactly where we're going to take our sample from. So to add a photo, click on the Images tab. tab. And if you're on the mobile app, you'll have slightly different uh, options here. You'll have the option to take an image with your tablet. I'm going to add an image from file. It's a photo. And I'm going to navigate to my photo and open that up. It's going to take a second to load. If you're following along still on a, a mobile device, you can just take a, a photo of your computer screen if you want to. OK, so here's our new image. We can name this. I'm going to name it baseline fault. And if you click on the thumbnail, it will bring up a uh, full version that you can add an image description. In this case, I'll add that the look direction is approximately 3.30 or so. This photo obviously is uh, of the baseline fault, looking at the red sandstone in the foot wall and the white sandstone in the hanging wall. So we can click back. And one of the fantastic things about Strabospot is that uh, we can use this image to kind of bridge scales between the map scale and the sample scale. And to do that, we're going to uh, turn this image into a base map by toggling the image's base map uh, toggle. At this point, a new icon pops up, the map icon. And clicking on this map icon will open this image as an image base map. So it looks fairly similar, but you'll notice that now we have this toolbar in the, on the left-hand side, and we can edit this image just as we edited the main map. So we're going to add a spot, 
showing um, approximately where we collected this sample. We're going to add a spot right here and name this spot sample one. Um, when you're working with image base maps, you get uh, base map coordinates or where this spot is on your base map. But remember, this is also still tied to our spot BF2. So um, we still maintain real world coordinates. I'm going to save changes. And now also I'm going to add a sample. Click the sample tab, click the blue plus, and I will add a sample. Sample one of the red unit. Um, I can add more uh, data here if I wanted to. And we'll save this by clicking save. And now going back to our map, we see that we have a sample recorded on this image based map. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, um, I want to go over how we could um, use drone imagery and a high resolution ortho image to change the location of a spot. So let's return to the main map by clicking on maps and main map. This will bring us back to um, the satellite view of our baseline fault. We're going to zoom in on our spot BF2. And although the map box satellite imagery um, is really nice, sometimes it doesn't have uh, great high resolution images. So to fix this, a uh, group went out and took a drone and made a ortho image based on stitched drone imagery. And I already loaded this into the project, but Doug's going to talk uh, later on about how easy it is to take these um, images and load them into Strabo Spot as base maps. So to set this as a base map, you're going to click to your click your layers, and here is my uh, baseline fault ortho image that I already loaded in. So I'm going to click on that. It'll take a second to load. And now you see this great high resolution imagery. And you can see that when I approximated our location with the uh, map box satellite imagery, I missed it by a little bit. So to change the location of this spot, I'm going to choose the edit spot tool, click it, click and drag my spot to a new location, which happens to actually be up here, and then click Save Edits. So at this point, I can zoom back out and turn back on my Mapbox satellite imagery to give me an overall view of both stations. So I think that's uh, more or less all I have right now. This is obviously going to be online. And um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to address those. So Alex gave you a nice demonstration of the basic functionality. The key is that we have had lots of different workshops to come up with the vocabulary to make sure we have the right words to describe geological structures. and that those, this vocabulary is hidden below particular tabs. So I'm just gonna work through in 10 minutes where those, um, some of that hidden words, those hidden words are and what they are. Um, they've been vetted multiple times. Um, if you see a problem though, um, let us know. I'll also say the reason to have a controlled vocabulary is search functionality. So for instance, you're gonna see there's gonna be a fold hinge and the ability to search in fold hinges on the data system is easiest if we have that controlled vocabulary. Okay, so I just pulled up a random data set. So you've seen this now, a lot of different tabs. Um, I'm gonna talk about the orientation tabs, the 3D structures tab and the fabrics tab, because these have 
a lot of the structural geology terminology sort of hardwired into them. If you look at orientations, and Alex did this, you can add a plane, you can add a line, you can add a tabular zone, um, or you can add something from clipboard. Um, so we're going to go through these in order. So if you do add a plane, you'll see exactly what Alex showed you before. Um, you can add what kind of plane it is and the quality of the measurement. That goes for pretty much everything. You can always add a quality of a measurement and there's always a notes page at the bottom. There's also a notes page at the beginning. That, this notes page at the beginning, this is sort of an aside, is if you have words that are not in the vocabulary but you want to know, you need to put them in this notes because that's the notes that we're gonna search on first when we do the searching functionality. So that's just a main notes page, which is very much just like a digital, like a page in your notebook. Okay, so we're gonna add a plane, we're gonna add a foliation. Once you add a foliation, you can see there's kind of a extensive list of what you wanna call it, shistosity, planar shistosity, anastomosing shistosity, and so forth. If you chose that, and then you said, well, you know, it's a seaplane, then you'd need movement on it, and then you have basically every possibility we have thought of for what you could have for movement on that. Um, then you'd want to say what are what's the criteria or what's your evidence for that, and then you have this, or you can choose other and then describe the other. So again, just basic vocabulary issues. If you chose add a line, same sort of thing you can say the quality of the line what the line is defined by and then there's a whole series of linear features that you can see um, so again it's going to be mostly you exploring what you see with um, on the data system tabular zones are the most interesting um, because this is your shear zones your fault zones on echelon vein arrays that sort of thing they still have a strike and a dip to them because they have um, planar boundaries, um, but they have a thickness to them now. And what are they defined by? So if you chose a tabular zone, and for instance, if you chose a shear zone, then you would have what are all the possibilities of shear zone motion. And then on the left is the different kinds of tabular features you could choose. So vein arrays, a vein, damage zones, enveloping surfaces and you can always choose other and then define it yourself. I should also say an advantage of graph databases is if we as a community find something that we deeply care about and in five years everybody's looking for that kind of tabular zone or that kind of planar feature, we have the ability to easily add things on. What we can't do is ever take things off the list. But adding things is not such a big deal. All right, and then if you choose specific things like a vein array, you're gonna get um, language like on echelon, general or other. And so the, the point is that there's a lot of embedded vocabulary here. All right, if you use 3D structures, I'm gonna go through these. You can add a fabric, you can add a fold, or you can add a tensor. Um, these are relatively rudimentary at this moment. Um, they, so for instance, with a fabric, if you chose out a fabric, you can say, what's the tectonite type? What's the tectonite character? Um, and so forth. So at least fabrics is, I should say, is rudimentary. Folds, oh my God, there's so much terminology associated with folds. Um, we've got most of it, um, particularly what kind of fold, what's its plunge, what's its trend. Um, this took a long time to make sure that we did well with the folds. You can subject, um, select planarity, measurement type, virgins, inner limb angle, um, what are the foliations associated with the folds, what's the competent material, what's the wavelength of the fold. Um, and then you choose the dominant fold type, so an upright plunging fold, and then you choose fold shape. So I just gave an example here of an upright plunging, uh, class 1B type, sharp fold in verging east. Um, so the point is you have all that language at your ability and then searchability. All right, if you're really into rock fabrics, the fabrics tab is obviously the place you wanna go. Um, there's rock fabrics, um, which is kind of a clue for structure fabrics. There's igneous fabrics and then metamorphic fabrics. 
So here, if we chose fault rock fabrics, you would say, okay, sort of following Sibson's uh, 1977 characterization, you can choose incohesive, which is non-foliated or foliated, or cohesive, non-foliated or foliated, and then a tectonite classification. So for instance, if you chose cohesive um, foliated fabric, you have all of these choices. Um, and then a whole set of terminology that comes out of them, including specifying what additional fabrics are, and then their spatial configuration, and then their tectonite type. Here in the fabrics, um, there's magmatic fabrics, there's non-magmatic fabrics, there's foliated ones versus lineated ones. Um, and then there's things that are sort of unique to plutons like cavities or myrolytic cavities or um, igneous pipes. Um, and there's solid state versus magmatic fabrics, you can also say for the igneous intrusions. Metamorphic, um, lots of things you can do. There's actually subcategories here where you can put in reactions, you can put in um, index minerals, um, so forth. But the basic screen is, you know, porphyroblastic, porphyroblastic. Um, are there additional fabrics like relic sedimentary bedding and so forth? Again, if you're really into metamorphic fabrics, two weeks from now, we're going to have one that's going to go into this and show metamorphic projects in detail. So another type of workshop, another kind of workshop. So just as an example of some of the vocabulary here is we're gonna do um, metamorphic rock types. So you have the different types of metamorphic rock fabrics and different kinds of linear fabrics you could get in the metamorphic rock. All right, that is what I have for that. Sketching is something the Strava Spot does, and it does it reasonably well and in a variety of different ways. So I wanna go through those ways because it's one of the powerful aspects of the system that beats what you do traditionally with a field notebook. There are four ways you can sketch with Strava Spot. One of which Alex started talking about, which is you can add points, lines, or polygons to an image base map. The second way is you can draw on paper and then upload the image, but specify that it's a sketch. You can sketch with a Strabo-specific um, tool, and that was really at the request of the sedimentology community that wanted that. Or you can do an added program. Like, so we use Sketch, it's free, it's fast, and it works well. Um, and I'm gonna go through all of these different things. All right, one of the coolest things is if you go to points, lines, or polygons, but if you hold down the line tool, it'll give you a squiggly line, which allows you then to freehand any line you want to do. And so I drew it in the sky just so you could see it. And that becomes a spot itself. It's a line spot. Um, and it also contains information. So you can draw on any image base, base map. This is a quartzite. This is a quarry in the Baraboo quartzite near Madison. And you can, uh, basically use this way to annotate the photos. What's nice about this is it has all the functionality of spots. So it contains all the information you would want to carry. So it might be that you don't want that much and you just want really just a simple sketch of an outcrop. So if you're very artistic, you can just draw in your field book, despite the fact you're having Strabo around, um, because you people can sketch better in this way. Um, and then, you go to the page where you add images, except you add, you don't hit the take a picture, you hit the add an image type, and then you choose sketch. And you do okay under that sketch. And what's cool here is you can use the sketch as an image base map itself. In other words, you can turn on that and you can say, actually my sample is from this little vein right here if you can't gather it well enough um, with a t just a photo. So there are places where you might wanna do that. Um, and so that's, a, you, that's sort of way number two of sketching. Way number three is a tool that we put in under the image files. And you've seen this, but you probably didn't notice it. It's this pencil um, that says sketch. 
So for any photo, you can choose that photo. Um, right. If you're in just an image, so first I'll do this. If you're just in an, in the, um, this and you just want to sketch with a blank piece of paper, you hit sketch on top. And so it provides a blank sheet of paper and you can draw a really crude diagram. And I did this um, without a pen, without the Apple pen, but just my finger. And so that's sort of the resolution you can do for a quick sketch if you want to do that. There is both a line function and an eraser function that you can use. So that, that is one opportunity. But in addition, if you have any image, you can go to more and under that more, you'll see a page and that page also has a pencil. So you can just annotate, this is from California, from the Mecca Hills, you can say, oh, here's the axial plane of this folded um, sedimentary rock out there. So that's also a very straightforward. And here, this is where the, the tool does really well just because you just need a simple line usually, or you know, a curved line. The tool is very rudimentary though. If you use the erase option, you erase the rock picture too. Um, you can duplicate the picture and then have a save the picture as it is and then save an annotated image. But because of the, the way the tool works right now, if you make a mistake, it's easier just to throw it out and start over. The option four, and this is what most of us do in the field, is we use an external program. So you're on your tablet, you say, I wanna, I'm in Strabo. Strabo saves all its pictures to the camera roll, and that's the critical point. Skitch, or any other program, will also access the camera roll. So you can be in Strabo, say, take a picture in an image, and then go right to Skitch and start basically annotating it. And all you do with, so this is Skitch now, not Strabo, is you go to the camera roll, you take the last picture, so this is vertical beds with uh, ripple marks on them, and then you can do any kind of annotation with any thickness of lines, right? So now you have a professional drawing program at your disposal so that you can um, do anything with all these fancy markers you want. So once you have that picture, then you go back to Strabo. I timed this. It takes 15 seconds to import an image. Is you go to Strabo spot, you go to add an image, you choose photo from the photo roll, and then you just import it. And then you get that annotated version. I think you can see it within Strabo spot. It takes 15 seconds. It's really fast to do. And it's really nice to have an annotated photo once you're, um, once you're in the field. So those are the options. All right. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is go through uh, a few things um, about tags and nesting. Uh, and then also I added a, a few short things about uh, to answer questions that have appeared in the chat box. And then at the very and I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about saving your data, exporting your data, and, and working with that. So this is a, a project that uh, I started on the very first version of Strabo in California. I've added to it as a testing project. A bunch of data out in the Mojave Desert. Uh, one thing that you can do is, uh, and Alex showed this well, the three line menu. And then the three dot will allow you to do things like um, zoom into uh, some spots. So I can do that, and then we we see now the extent of spots that are are in this area. One thing that I use a lot, and that uh, you can use a lot, are these things we call tags. Uh, as Basil explained, what tags are were uh, they're, they're basically sticky notes you can put on. One of the things that I use them for pretty extensively are rock units. So you can see examples of different rock units here. Everybody hearing this okay? Yes, you were a little garbled, at least on my end for oh, a bit. But, okay. but, 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 but it actually, it's all worked out okay, I think. Okay, so you can see on here there are different 
numbers of units that I have assigned to different uh, different rock types. Let me just go into to one of these, uh, this JFD. When I do that, it tells me what type of tag it is. And the tags can be geologic units. They could be a concept uh, like brecciation, a rosetta outcrop, a very specific, beautiful outcrop. Uh, you can just have a, a documentation type of tag. And then, as Basil said, everything else uh, you can put under other and you have a full vocabulary there. This is a geologic unit. I can hit the little blue eye uh, right here and then I get a unit label, uh, Felsic Dyke, and then I can go through and describe it. If I want, um, once I have some geochronology from this, um, which I do now, uh, I would say it's Phanerozoic, Mesozoic, and you can see it's adding more context down to here as I go, uh, Jurassic, and I can add more detail, such as late, and we have a zircon age on this of 150, which I'm typing in. Uh, and I could then put in an uncertainty if I wanted, um, if I wanted here as well. One thing people have asked about is when do things get saved? If I hit this back arrow, that information is now saved to the database. So whenever you're done doing something and you go to the next page or you take an action, all of the data uh, gets saved. So uh, the tags are very, quite very useful to, to work with. Um, we can, as we've talked about before, add tags by doing the plus sign up here. And then we can give it a name First thing you do, I'll just call this test for right now. And then if I went down to, for example, concept, then I can look at different types of concepts. So is this a structure? Is it a marker layer, a deformation event? And again, when you go down to the bottom, maybe it's something else that you're working on. You hit other concept, you get to put in a type, and then you can put in notes. So this is how you create the tags and using the tags, um, if you go to a spot, let me just go back to my main map now. I'm gonna zoom in on this spot up to the north here. If I click on it, then I get, um, oops, come on. I get this dialogue that says see more. I have the camera and the sketch tool here or the notes tool. I can take pictures at this point if I want. I can look at images, but if I hit the see more, then I get to see all of the different tabs going across the top for orientation, structures, images, etc. And then if I look at this spot menu, uh, I can add or remove a geologic unit, which is a tag, so I can work with my geologic units. Or if I hit the tag button at the top, I can put any kind of tagging I want on. One of the things you see here is this option for continuous tagging off or on. Um, so one place that I use this is if I'm out in the field and I'm in a particular rock unit, uh, that I keep getting the same unit over and over. I'll just turn continuous tagging on and, and always add that tag. How many tags can you add to a spot? As many as you want. Uh, so uh, depending upon the logic of what you're working on and the outcrop, you could add one or 50 tags for different things if you wanted to a, to a spot. Uh, you'd have to keep track of all those though. And then again, when you go to the tags menu, uh, it shows you all the tags. One other thing I'll say about the, the side menu here or the, the three line menu, uh, each one of these will access everything in your project. So if I hit the spots term here, then I get all 180 spots. I can go through those 
And then for each spot, you'll see an orientation. Sorry, you'll see something beside it, uh, which is what kind of data are present and then the tags that are present for that. If I hit images, I get a picture, I get all the images that are in the stored with this particular uh, file, uh, particular project. Uh, samples, I can look at all the samples at once. Uh, relationships, tags, main maps, image-based maps. Tomorrow we'll get into the other maps that you can put in, but for example, with this particular project, I've put in uh, several other types of maps. Uh, all of these are coming from a, a program or a service called Map Warper, and we'll get into Map Warper tomorrow uh, in more detail. But each one of these is a separate map that I can put in as a base layer, or if I set it as an overlay, I can make a semi-transparent uh, map over the top of any other map. So for this particular area, I have the Dunn map. This is a thesis map by George Dunn. Click OK. Now I'm going to go back to my main map. The zoom out now. And I'm going to go into this area. And then I have overlay maps. I can switch on the Dunn map. And now I can see his geologic map as the background. And if I want to, I can go to the other base maps here, go to the Dunn map and say, well, I really only want it at 30%. Then when I go to the main map, I get it again, but with a lighter version over the top. You can see that there. So these are just some of the, the features of maps and uh, some of the features of tags that we use. Um, one of the other things that we go into that I, that I use a lot in here um, is the idea of nesting. So let me zoom out here a little ways. And I'm going to turn off the done overlay map. And I'm going to go up here to uh, the spot DP0. DP0 is the very first spot in the Strabo spot database uh, in 2015. Uh, I can click on it. And we can see um, there's an image in here. I can go in to see more. And again, you've been through a lot of these uh, aspects of it. But one thing I can do here now is I can click the nesting tab. And what nesting does, and I'll spend just a minute on this, is it gets me to the hierarchical relationship here. And right now I'm showing this spot and it has two first generation children and one second generation ch ch child. So basically what this means is that this spot has two more spots associated with it. Because they're this little circle and then what looks like a picture, uh, those are spots on images. Those are going to be image base map spots. And then this is an image base map spot. So I can, I can move around from here as much as I want. So for example, if I click into DP2 now, this spot, I can see where its parent is. But if I click images here, I can see that I don't have any here. I go back to nesting. DP2 has no children. If I go back to DP0, I can go to DP3. And then you can see it's where DP4 is. I can click on it now. And then I can see the picture I've taken in here. Uh, somebody was asking about Apple pencils. I usually use a stylus of this sort. But then going back to DP3 again, then I can go to images here. And then if I move this as a map, you can see that the picture where I took DP4 was on this outcrop right here. 
So that's the, the logic of nesting that we get with, uh, with Strabo. Again, you can go as many levels of nesting as you want. So for example, let me just keep going back here. Um, if I decide, for example, that these five spots I'm showing here are within a single rock unit, as Basil said, I could go in, I could draw a polygon, around these and that just completed the polygon. Once I complete it, it sticks the spot in and saves it. And now if I go to nesting here, it automatically knows that the spots that I just circled are all within that particular nest. So I can keep going and, and doing these sorts of things. I can keep arranging things, nesting stuff together as much as I want. And you got a feel for that with Basil's talk. And also if you go to the Geosphere paper about Strabo spot, you'll see a lot of that as well. Then if I decide, well, that spot, uh, I really don't want to add that. I can always go see more and I can delete the spot. Say, sure I do. And now I'm back to just where I was before. All right, so this is uh, getting through a few different things that we see with mapping, using this for mapping. Uh, again, one thing that uh, we've talked about a little bit is Mapbox Satellite, other maps. With this one, for example, if I click the three dot menu here, uh, you can see several options. The second one down is Save Map for Offline Use. When I do that, I get a dialogue of what type of data it is in different zoom levels that I can save to. So for example, if I wanted to save to zoom level 19, uh, it means I'd load down, download around 5,000 tiles to get to that level. I'm not gonna do that. It takes a couple of minutes to do that. But I can go out for this entire map and I can save images to whatever base layer I want, whether it's Mapbox Satellite, Mapbox Topo, or if, for example, I looked at this map from George, a different map from George Dunn, I could bring this map in as well, tile it for offline use. So as long as I've tiled it for offline use, saved it for offline use, it doesn't really matter if I'm live or if I'm offline. This green dot up here, tells me when I'm online, uh, it's red if I'm offline. All right, well, I wanted to spend a few minutes with, with that and the other base maps. Um, I wanna get to a different project right now and show just a little bit of the interoperability that you'll see later on. So I'm gonna to go to my project here. And now uh, I'm gonna to go to the three line menu and I'm gonna switch projects and I'm gonna change it to Field Camp 2019. When you change projects, you'll get all kinds of different warnings that'll come up. Um, and I'm going to turn on this one that I'm gonna call the Blue Ridge Project. It has 118 spots and 33 photos with it. It's downloading those right now. Not, not too sluggish, but I'm also on university Wi-Fi, so it works quite well. Then I'm gonna to go to my main map. When I go to the main map, it automatically, no, it doesn't here because I have this other thing set up. I can uh, zoom to extent of spots. Whoa. And I have the background image here. I can see different rock units here. So for example, if I select this blue unit and see more, I can see all of the, um, I put on nesting. I can see all the spots that are within this that have been worked on and that particular blue area spot that I put in. But the other thing I wanna show you is right around this area down here, it's clear that the rock units are folded. One of the aspects of interoperability we're working on and, and that Rick Allmendinger has worked very well with us He'll show that later in the week and, and Alan Glazer will show interoperability as well, is I can lasso spots for 
taking into stereo net. So one thing that, that is very common is to choose some spots by just putting a lasso around them. It says it's been copied to the clipboard. Now I'm just simply going to go into Rick Almendinger's stereo net program, go to data and open at the bottom, and then I can just click to add it from the clipboard and replace data. Now here's all the new data that I just brought in. And then I can go back to the stereo net, change this to polls. And now you can see that I've been able, what, in 15, 20 seconds to take data straight from uh, Strabo and put it in stereo net. Rick will show us how to go back the other direction as well. And so this is, this is some of the interoperability uh, that we're working on here uh, as well. Again, we'll see more of that later. So that's most of what I wanted to, to expand upon from what you've already heard today um, about mapping and some of the ways, ways that I've used this and some of the ways uh, you can use it. Uh, I'll just wait a second or two here. If anybody has any questions, uh, just type them into the chat window and then I'm going to go on to a, a, a slightly different subject for a little bit. Basil, do you have anything or any of the other Strabo folk, anything you want to add to this? No, I think you've hit everything quite nicely. I have nothing to add. Thank you, Basil. There's a lot of power in here. The one thing I will add right here is that you can see the, the drawing potential uh, that has come in here. StraboSpot is a, a data collection tool. It's not aimed to be a GIS. And what I'll show you in just a minute is you can get the, the projects here out in a number of different ways or in in a number of different ways, and that's including going to and from GIS systems. And Joe Andrew will talk more about that on, on Wednesday. Doug, there was a practical question of how do you actually map the contacts in the field? Do you like turn them on or do you do that at the end of the day or do you do it with the satellite or just- so let me just, uh, I'll just show you here for this particular map area. I'll go to Mapbox Topo or satellite. And let me just turn off the spots that are here. Yeah. And so, for example, in this area, there's a nice quartzite band. In the field with this, what I would do is I'd grab the line tool, and then I would just start drawing the line in to where I was. And I would set this, for example, to a trace feature known, oops, a known contact. So now I have this trace feature drawn. And then if I were to extend this trace feature, what I would do, what I usually do is I just hit the edit button, grab the last point, drag it on, and then move things up and down to fill in the contact. So that's how I would do this. Um, you can do a lot of different ways, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. And then when I save edit, it's, it's added to there. I think that's all the questions that were not addressed um, by okay. a text comment. So Great. Go ahead. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, people worry about and I worry about a huge amount is what happens to my data? How do I not lose data, et cetera? And if you go to um, the strabospot.org page, um, you will find that there is a, a help system here, a help menu. And uh, one of the sections is how to save a project, manage them. And then on page 30 is um, the manage and page 31 is project backing up data. How do I back up my data? I don't want to lose anything. Um, and there are many ways you can do this. Um, you can back up. If you're online, you can always upload your project to the server. That is probably the most, the safest way of doing it. 
Um, if you're offline in the middle of nowhere using Android, what do you do? Um, you export, and I'll, I'll show this in just a minute. You can export the project to your device, stick an SD card in it, and uh, copy it, and then you'll have it backed up that way. If you're using iOS, you would do the same export to device. And then if you have a Mac with you or something with iTunes, you can copy the data off. Um, one of the things that you can remember uh, throughout this is all the exports are uh, stored in a format called GeoJSON. I'll talk about that on Friday. And GeoJSON is ASCII and it's readable. Um, and uh, things like QGIS, ArcGIS, GitHub can read it. So you, you can save things that way. Um, and what else can go wrong? You could overwrite a project, and I'm a really paranoid what's the minimum I can do. Always export your project device. Every time you do the export, it creates a new copy of it. It doesn't, uh, your projects are never overwritten completely. If you upload your project to the server, it actually saves a version uh, that's preserved. Uh, you can go back to older versions if you make mistakes. So we, we try to do all these sorts of things as much as possible. Uh, just remember, if you lose your iPad, it's just like losing your field book. There's no real way around that unless you've Xeroxed your field book or backed up your, your iPad. Um, so this is one of the, the help menus. This is, the help system here will explain a, a lot of different things that we uh, go on in here. So I would suggest going there and looking at it. We have several different help uh, manuals and resources that are available online if you, you wanna get to that. Um, so here's some projects. Uh, you've seen this sort of before. But one thing I can do is if you look over to the side here, uh, you can select different ways to download features. So one of the things you can do is download your data as shapefiles. Uh, you can then take it straight into a GIS. Uh, KMZ, uh, you can view it in Google Earth, XLS, Excel, StereoNet for orientation data. And then there's this field book view mode. Uh, we'll get the strat sections later, but in field book, uh, this is something that you can export to get your data out as kind of a PDF. What well, is a PDF that uh, preserves a lot of the information and relations. And uh, where I use this with field camp groups um, is, um, let me go to files here. Um, so I just exported this with field camp groups. I can have them output their data set uh, and I can look at it. It gives me their spots, the locations, uh, time that they were taken, all their information about that, et cetera. So um, I use this, uh, this is all the K that I use in teaching field camp uh, at KU. Um, and I've used this for years. One of the things you'll hear on Thursday is that um, we now have students do everything on, the, on their iPad. They produce their uh, reports on iPads, they do stereo nets, they do everything like that that they can on the iPad. And last year we had them actually uh, use keynotes to do presentations to the rest of the field camp about their their work and it all makes a very nice self-contained uh, project that we uh, use. You might ask, how do we get maps out? Um, what students will typically do for a map like this is they'll do a screen capture and that screen capture then becomes part of their field camp report. One of the nice things with screen captures and in going into reports uh, quite a bit. And if there were some particular feature here that you wanted to highlight, again, you could capture that and bring it into a report to discuss it. So there are a lot of different, uh, different uh, output options and different ways of capturing information. All right.
think that's about 25 minutes. Okay, so that is concludes day one. Uh, thank you all for sticking with us um, for that. Just a couple logistical issues. So part of learning Strabo is just using Strabo. So we would like everybody to create their own project. Um, we worked a lot with the sedimentologists on this issue. We can only reimburse people at U.S. universities, but we got the okay to do this from the NSF director. So if you're willing to create your own project, you can get funding to do so. If you involve a student or two with it, we will pay them as well. So the idea here is just we're trying to get people familiar with this. We have extra travel budget um, that we had hoped to use. We can't use it. Um, so we're hoping just to give it to the community to try and motivate people to do that. Um, and that will come from the University of Kansas. And we can pay U.S. nationals and we can pay people at U.S. universities. And I'm sorry about that. We really did try to do something more um, international, but we're just kind of stuck with it the National Science Foundation rules. Just for tomorrow, same time, same channel, um, we're gonna have importing base maps for about 45 minutes to an hour with Doug showing you how to import different ones with Map Warper, different ways of doing that. Um, Nick might also participate with that. And then Wednesday, which is the next official time, we're just gonna go through the search capabilities, how to make a strat section, sort of details about that about this very particular example, which I think will be very useful. Um, you'll show you some of the group tools from Alan Glasner, and you'll get a sneak peek at Strabo Micro, which is being developed. So then the spots go right all the way from a sample, and then they just keep going into thin sections and different image analysis techniques. Doug, do you want to say anything about the create your own project? We don't really care where it is. We don't, really we don't care, care where it is or how you do it. So you can start out with a blank piece of paper, or if you have a GIS map, you can bring it in as a, you can bring in your shape files. If you have stereo net data, uh, hundreds of stereo net uh, measurements, you can actually import those into Strabo as well. Uh, clean those up and create your own project. So we don't really care. One thing I will add about tomorrow is tomorrow will be everything offline, how to, how to get ready to do everything offline, including run a field campaign uh, without interconnectivity to the outside world. Great, so if you have any questions about that, um, we would like the project to be public and interesting. So I mean, oh, just yeah. like throw one point on there and call it good, right? What we're trying to get is, something so you're really using the data system to um, explore it a little bit and show, I mean, the idea is at the end of the um, Friday, we want to show people's projects that other people are doing. Um, so this is just a, a case where you can do well and do good at the same time. There'll be, uh, you'll make your uh, projects public uh, and we'll go over, please try to have them uploaded by Thursday late at night. Uh, we'll go over on Friday morning and pick half a dozen or so that uh, highlight different uses of Strava spot for everybody. We can deal with all of the ones that might get uploaded. And we'll likely ask you to talk, we'll make like three slides of it or something and then we'll ask you to talk through it if you want to, if otherwise we'll do it for you, but it'd be better if you do that. The last thing is now, between now and Wednesday, we are here to serve you. So if you wanna do this and you have like a help desk that's basically waiting for you, this is what the data, the Strabo help um, looks like. You just put the time, the date, um, who you are, here, whatever your question is, and then we'll initial it and we'll respond. And then we will also, so that will be a permanent record on Strabo, but then we'll also um, send you through your email, whatever email you put down, we'll send you the response directly. And so that's available all week until Friday um, at this time. And uh, like I said, this is a great opportunity. You have people who are here and willing to help. So that's all I have to say.